Our scripture, reader, scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, verses, chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Indeed, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of, of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested, as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I think Chris is going to stop doing the children's uh, sermons if I keep giving him the most difficult. Last week it was the entire book of Job. Um, and this week, a random passage from the middle of Hebrews. Oh, that was great. It is. It, it is it's real. Uh, that's the whole point. So you've, you've got a, a great preview. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, who spoke the world into being with just a word, may your word be spoken this morning. And God, who always hears us when we pray, may we hear you. In your holy name, amen. So a universal joy, I think, of parenthood is getting to watch our children grow up. And sure, some of the life stages are probably more obviously fun than others, um, but every moment that I have experienced thus far from that first smile of my first baby to moving our eldest into her first apartment in a brand new city where she didn't know anybody, brimming with hope and nerves and excitement to start a medical school program, and then I had to drive away and leave her. They all have their own sort of magic, don't they? Oh, oh, okay, well, maybe not the part where they huff up the stairs and slam the door to their bedrooms. You know, that, that one might not be magical, but it is recognizable, isn't it? Let's be honest, adults. Aren't there days when we all still wish we could do that, too? <laughs> but one of my favorite stages is the toddler stage. It's a very short time period, but it's the one where they figured out the idea of object permanence, um, where you can play peekaboo with them still, but at this point, they, they have understood that you're not actually leaving when you cover your face. They know you're gonna come back, they're anticipating that, but they have not yet quite understood that when they can't see you, you can still see them. You know what I'm talking about? The stage where Playing hide and seek means that when it's their turn to hide, they sort of like crouch down in the middle of the floor and just cover their eyes and think they're hidden because they can't see you. And we've all done that, haven't we? Whether it was with our own children or a niece or a nephew, a grandchild, we play along. We walk around saying things like, where could Evie be? I can't find her anywhere. And then they giggle and delightedly get found, you know. Sometimes in my house they would jump up and say, I hear her, because they didn't like to be hid hidden for too long. And there's one instance that I still think about. Elsa could not quite have been 18 months old, and I had walked away for just a moment. But I came back into the kitchen, and I caught her taking a cookie off the cookie sheet when I'd asked her to wait. And I asked her to wait because I didn't want her to burn her hands. They'd just come out of the oven. And what I remember most vividly is the look of panic and fear and maybe shame that went across this little bitty face. And she crouched down and covered her face. Because if I couldn't see her, if she couldn't see me, then I couldn't see her in her little mind. She was caught doing something she knew she shouldn't have been, and so she hid, because she was scared. 
And that impulse, that impulse to hide when we've done something wrong, it's baked into our DNA. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and their eyes were opened, they realized that they'd done something wrong. And what did they do? They hid. They hid from God. And they hid from themselves. Think about it. Adam blames Eve. And and Eve blames the snake. And maybe our scripture today gives us some insight into why we do this. The word of God, Will read, is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Well, that does not sound pleasant to me, necessarily. And maybe that's why so many Christians have kind of an allergy to opening their Bibles and reading them. We read that the word is sharper than any two-edged sword and that it is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts, and we are sorely tempted to just hide. And if Adam and Eve have taught us anything, it is that there is no effective method of hiding your guilt from yourself than by pointing out the guilt of other people, right? I mean, the testimony of so many who have left the church, the testimony of our younger generations who find that they might be interested in God but have no interest in the church is that so many of us who are in the church seem to really enjoy sicking the scripture on them and on other people and on one another. Only, that's not really how any of this works. For two reasons. The first should be pretty obvious. You can't hide from God. The psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I descend and make my bed in Sheol, you are there. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that before God, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Hiding is no use. God will see us anyway, and that's part of what it is to be God. And that's part of what we're afraid of, I think. That no matter what we do, our guilt will always be found out, and there's nothing we can do about it. And this is the stuff that triggers in us a desire to try to be perfect. And a despair when we acknowledge, as we all must eventually, that we cannot be perfect. But the second reason this doesn't work is that we are ignoring what the word is, or rather, who the word is. Because you see, the book of Hebrews is an epistle, a letter, written as best as biblical scholars can tell relatively early in the time after Jesus' resurrection, likely around the same time that the Gospel of Mark was written. Now, the writer doesn't explicitly mention who he is. He could have been Paul. He definitely knows Timothy. Timothy is mentioned in this letter. So if he's not Paul, he was certainly part of Paul's missionary activity. And we also don't know exactly who he's writing to. You'll notice this one is not written to the people of a particular place, like Romans or Corinthians or Galatians. But we know that it was written to a group of Hebrews, hence the title of the letter that we have given it, a congregation specifically of Hebrew people who believe that Jesus is Lord and who are also so very tired. They are tired of being different. They are tired of being misunderstood. They are tired of trying to keep their prayer lives going. And they're trying to figure out how it is that being members of this family of God, being members of this body of Christ, is worth it. They're familiar with the law and with the prophets. It's their native language. And they believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. Only now that they're living it, they're discovering that it's still really hard. That feels familiar. And so we might be tempted to wonder why this preacher who is writing to them decides to tell them, as he does in the passage immediately preceding the one that we just read, about all the ways their ancestors failed. 
in their attempts to be faithful to God. And he doesn't just tell them how hard the law is. He goes ahead and tells them how hard it is to have faith. That is not very encouraging. But he's going somewhere with this. And if we go with him, we might just be surprised by the beauty of what we find. So back to the what and the who of this word that is sharper than any double-edged sword. Well, this word, in whom there is no darkness at all, who shines the very light of the glory of God on our lives and shows us every shadow of turning in ourselves, this word is Christ himself. He is the revelation of God, the one whom God sent to show us who God is, to show us his glory, to show us what perfection actually looks like walking around in the world. And of course, the word, the scripture that we have, is a way that God speaks to us, a way that Jesus is still being revealed to us. We read the scripture, and when we do, we allow it to read us back. And we allow it to share us, share with us the heart of God, to show us his desires for us. And I won't lie, this can be uncomfortable. Have you ever been reading the scripture, and as you read those words on the page, you think, I don't think this used to say that. I have. We discover that we've been thinking about it all wrong, or maybe we discover We've been doing it all wrong, or maybe we discover we've still been doing it all wrong. And if that's the only way you ever think of Scripture, if that's the only way you ever think of God, just one big accusation, well, no wonder so many people don't want to get too close to it. No wonder so many of our brothers and sisters in Christ walk around flogging themselves and other people for their sins all the time talking about hellfire and brimstone and implying that apart from Christ's atoning blood, God wouldn't have ever wanted anything to do with us. But on the other hand, no wonder we have so many Christian brothers and sisters who lean so wholly into God's mercy, saying that God is love and, and God's mercy and kindness so that judgment isn't necessary because it doesn't feel kind. So they insist it isn't relevant well, that latter idea is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer would have called cheap grace. But did you also know that he rejected that former idea as a new legalism, something that could only become the instrument of sinful human self-righteousness? So is there a third option? What do we do? How do we receive judgment? How can we stand in the glory of God and live. How is any of this good news? Well, the answer, of course, is Jesus Christ himself, the great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. For we do not serve a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but instead we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are and yet is without sin. You're all aware that in the religion of Judaism, the, the religion of the Christ followers who made up this Christian congregation that they would have been a part of before they knew Jesus, the high priest is the one who made the atonement for your sins. You, you adhered to the law as best you could, but when you needed to atone, you took your offering to the high priest, some grain or a dove or a lamb, whatever was prescribed for the thing you needed to atone for, and that high priest would offer it on your behalf to God to atone for your sins or for the sins of your whole community. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is this congregation's and our high priest, the one who intercedes on our behalf, who atones for us. And in the ultimate paradox, Christ is not only the high priest, and he is also the sacrifice. He is fully God, perfect in all of his glory, and fully man, tempted as we are, and yet without sin. And here's the thing. Jesus' perfection does not make him judgmental. 
which is our fear, isn't it? Jesus is so perfect that what if he's judging me every time I fail? No. The writer of Hebrews insists that this perfection makes him merciful. It makes him kind. It means he gets it. It means that far from needing to try to be perfect, again and again and again, you can simply be yourself. We can call out to him in complete honesty. And I mean honesty. You can call out to him cursing and weeping and begging and whining and confessing the worst and the best of yourself. Because as John tells us in his gospel, God did not send his son to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And because of Jesus, our high priest, our savior, our friend, we do not have to fear God's judgment. In fact, we are, a told, we are told that we can approach the throne of grace. We can approach God in all of God's glory with boldness so that we might receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Let me say that again. We receive judgment so that we can receive grace. We confess so that we can receive mercy. These two things, God's awful, literally full of awe, God's awful glory and perfection, and Christ's never-ending mercy and grace, they're linked. And he longs to atone for you to make you at one atone, at one, to make you at one with him and with one another. To avoid judgment, to avoid confessing, it's to settle for a fearful, cringing sort of faith. A faith that strives always to be perfect and dreads hearing all the ways you've missed the mark. Or else it's to settle for a distant echo of faith. For a faith that desperately affirms God's love for who you are now because you're afraid that perhaps you can't ever measure up to who God would call you to be if you'd only let him. But he has called you to a more perfect way. He has called us to confess and he has promised to be with us in the hurt and in the weakness and even in the temptation and his love, which we already know endured to the very end, literally to hell and back, will bring you through to be made more fully yourself and more fully and wholly his. When Elsa hid from me because she was caught doing something she shouldn't have because she was afraid, broke my heart. I scooped her up, all streaked with chocolate, and I held her close, and I told her again and again how much I loved her, and I said, baby, did you burn your hand? And she looked up with me, eyes brimming with tears, and said, mama, ow. And I kissed her fingers, and we got an ice pack. When Adam and Eve sinned, when they hid, their father who loves them made them clothes because they felt ashamed. And he did not forget them. He sent his son so that all the world might be saved. So confess. Confess your fears. Confess your joys. Confess your sins. Confess that Jesus is Lord and let him save you again and again and again in a myriad tiny ways. And all the big ones as well. Until you are made as he is. Loving one another as he loved us. Because you have nothing to fear. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.